officially Ergi Hutomo is a professor of media history and theory at UCLA in the Department of Design and Media Arts. But if you ask him, he'll tell you he's a media archaeologist. It's a provocative term, making Ergi a proactive historian, interested in the, in the recovery and analysis of historical artifacts as a way to engage cultural significance. But while some uh, traditional archaeologists focus on a time period, like the Cretaceous period or something like that, uh, Ergi is ambitious in the sweep of history, looking at the most current technologies as easily as he uncovers precedents in even ancient times. And if that wasn't enough, he writes about media, he produces media as an artist, collaborating with other artists as well as doing his own, collects media, and curates exhibitions about media. To give a sense of the range and complexity of his work, uh, you only have to read a list of his incredible essay titles. So here's a, here's a list of some of his writings. Encapsulated Bodies of Motion, From Cybernation to Interaction, Shaking Hands with Statues, From Kaleidoscomaniac to Cyber Nerd, Time Traveling in the Gallery, Trouble at the Interface, my personal favorite, Elements of Screenology, uh, and his forthcoming book, Illusions in Motion. And since we are talking about virtuality during Watson Festival, it's real, a real privilege to have a veritable encyclopedia of virtual media, the very real Eric Hutton. And uh, so I was um, so, like, suggested um, by the organizers to try to uh, speak you a little bit about the ar kind of an archaeology of projection, which is an enormous topic. You know, and, uh, obviously, we'll be able only to sort of like scratch a surface, but hopefully scratch hard at least some spots of the, some parts of the surface you know, to get something something out of that. So so let's see how that will go. And um, I'm also going to observe the um, the time and if I see uh, see many of you sort of like uh, closing off, you know, then I probably will, will make it shorter. If uh, if not so then I will give the slightly longer version. <coughs> I um, I love uh, mad scientists. I'm not one myself, you know. And, um, and, and uh, surely these, these eyes you see on the screen belong to one of them. And, uh, and one, of, one of the really forgotten mad scientists whom I discovered some years ago. I'm not going to tell you who, who that person is. Not quite yet, so we'll, uh, we'll encounter that person on the way a little bit later. So the title would be a little bit less advent adventurous than some of those other titles that Pablo mentioned. So projecting images from, the, from a media archaeological uh, perspective. And, um, and Pablo gave you a pretty, actually pretty good uh, introduction about what that <coughs> thing called media archaeology uh, might be. Um, I'm not planning to spend too much of the time with that definition here for the obvious reason that it would, would probably take half of our half of our time. So I'm, let me just basically say that the field that that me and a couple of other scholars have been trying to um, put together little by little. So I think I started working uh, on these ideas in the early 1990s. Uh, so probably used the word media archaeology for the first time, I believe, in 1992. In a, in, a, in a paper I, I wrote. I think uh, even though there are many different sort of like uh, um, emphasis between, between us and I, I don't necessarily agree with, with all, the, all the people using that concept. So I think we could say that what we all share is this kind of uh, interest in uh, excavating a uh, secret, forgotten, neglected and or suppressed histories. So, which basically tries to say that, that we think there is more than, than what's been recorded in the history books of these various different, different arts. There are things that, that need to be uh, rediscovered that, and, and potentially, uh, that can potentially change the way how we actually understand these, these fields. And, and I think that for that reason, we should pay attention to the so-called losers, or shall we say, dead ends of history, 
just as much as, as we pay attention to winners, so the people who became rich and famous and, 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 and who are covered in, in, uh, in TV programs by the History Channel or, or wherever, or about whom movies are made or things like that. Because those losers and dead-ends, so-called losers and dead-ends, can be actually pretty important and interesting. And actually, in many cases, we see that they actually were not losers and dead-ends at all. If we put these things in a much bigger frame of reference, all of a sudden, these, these things gain a quite new and different importance. And I believe that I'll be able to show you a couple of examples tonight. Also, I think that what media archaeology is doing, it is trying to sort of like dig, so dig beyond so-called pseudo-histories, like, uh, or we also speak about crypto-histories sometimes, which means, let's say, that kind of histories that corporations like Microsoft or Kodak have, have paid uh, historians right, which don't necessarily tell the full story. They still tell a kind of a story from a pretty biased perspective. And I think that it is a task of my media archaeology to dig beyond that kind of stories and, 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 and reveal the other side or the third side or fourth side or how many sides there may be to that kind of stories. Also, I think it is important to understand that even though many popular history books give you linear narratives of like media like photography or, or media like cinema or, or you name it. So the histori historical evolution is, is very rarely such, such simple linear progression. So history is a many, it's actually a very complex affair, a layered affair. There are continuities, there are ruptures. And, and, uh, and, and so, so I think that that, that the big challenge is really to sort of like understand how that sort of like layered nature, how that complexity of, of, of media history works. And then we can probably and hopefully gain you understanding about some of those elements that, that seem sort of like self-evident for us. So a media archaeologist, and this is my one sort of like kind of opening, the, the last opening point, I think has to be in a way, an insider and an outsider at the same time. And this is also very important. Is that you have to be an insider, and this means you have to be able to dig into those historical periods as if you were living in those periods. Understand the history from the perspective of, of the people at the time. So like, look at things with their eyes. But at the same time, you have to understand that, that this is an ideal, idealistic version. It, it never, it's never possible. We always have to sort of like also be very aware and conscious of the fact that we are always looking at these things from the outside. And the fact that we are looking at these things from the outside affects the picture. So there's a certain kind of tension and dynamics between being here, based here in the early 21st century, looking back to those, those periods in time, trying to sort of like understand how, you know, in a some sense, these two positions can sort of like inform each other. So this is basically just a sort of like very, very short and condensed uh, sort of like uh, version of some of the things that I think media archaeology tries to deal with. And okay, so let's, let me uh, now start from a very simple example. This is the Lumiere cinematograph, which was first uh, shown in 1895. And now, if you look at histories of cinema, this is usually seen as the, sort of like the starting point of the uh, history of moving images. And uh, that was widely celebrated in, in uh, 1995, so about more than 15 years ago, as the, so sort of like when people kind of thought that, well, now we have a medium which is exactly 100 years old. And I think that this is one of the things that the kind of media archaeological perspective really questions. Because we think that, that the fact that Lumiere cinematograph has been taken to be as a kind of like a starting point for the culture of like 
moving images is a, is a simplification and comes from the fact that that people have felt that that so like looking backwards in time from their own time so like look thinking about cinema thinking about feature film all these things so like trying to kind of try to say that well okay that was the moment when that thing started happening so that it was the beginning but we start seeing more and more clearly that 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 moment is, is not insignificant, you know, but it only represents uh, one sort of like post in a much, much longer sort of like uh, evolution, uh, of, which uh, deals with moving images, showing moving images, things like that. So it just represents a, 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 a stage or station, so to say, uh, that, that meant something important but not something all important i would say and and i'll show you a little bit what that how we can sort of like basically see how we could possibly see these things a little bit differently so this is basically the idea this is uh, from uh, the american pioneer of cinema from about the same time actually one year later edison how he started uh, projecting images in in, uh, in big theaters these were not movie palaces because this was sort of like a novelty, but vaudeville houses and places like that uh, on a screen. And you see the beams of light coming from the projector, which was actually, in this case, hidden already in a kind of a projection booth. There's an early, early example. So these kind of things people sort of like identify as the origins of what, what came, come, came later. But if we think about that thing, we probably should kind of draw a few conclusions. First of all, there are many varieties of projection and, and these uh, have been using many different kinds of surfaces, have been presented in many different situations and, and for very many different purposes. That kind of idea that we find represented in, let's say, this illustration is just one rather small element within a much, much wider phenomenon. The other thing is that when we look at, let's say, the culture of moving images, so these days we often speak about visual media, the history of visual media, we can say that even projection itself actually is just one mode of presenting and consuming media imagery. There are many different apparatuses whose histories, I would say, run parallel with projection and merge with it. And I would like to briefly kind of like just show you this, this idea so that, so that, so like, even though we don't have time to look at these things in, in detail, I think we could basically talk about at least four practices, four practices of presenting and consuming uh, visual media imagery and this could be called screen <coughs> practice, speed practice, touch practice and mobile practice and all these things have their own histories. Uh, B practice, um, as, as you see here we have a huge amount of material about situations which are actually pretty different from what we generally understand with this idea about projecting images. So this means looking inside some kind of a little device or sometimes big device, looking at these things through magnifying lenses in such a situation that what's immediately surrounding you in that space is in a way blocked from view. So you're sort of like encountering something within those devices in a sort of like more intimate manner even though you may be surrounded by people like like in that picture on the on the on the left uh, corner where you see ladies looking into so-called mutoscope machines they were called early flip kind of crank operated flip real machines showing moving pictures in the early 20th century and indeed, so if we look at not just projection, but, but this idea about peak practice, we immediately notice that, that uh, in around the same time that Lumiere Brothers 
showed those uh, cinematograph films that we actually were projected by the device that they, they invented. So the Lumiere cinematograph as, that I showed you was, was special because it was a camera, it was a developing device, and it was a projector at the same time. It would be adapted for all those purposes very easily and actually played a role in its success. But at the same time, in the United States, there was Thomas Edison, a famous inventor, who came up with uh, his own idea for, for moving images. And he imagined this would be the future. And this was the so-called Pipso kinetoscope. So a device where there was, a, was another, there was a strip of film, short film, that actually ran as an, as an endless loop inside the device. You paid a coin and you were able to look at the film through that kind of viewing device on the top of the machine. By the way, if we look at the structure of the machine, you can see that these early devices were meant for grown-ups because it was very difficult for children to peek into this kind of early devices. So, so the, the structure of the machine tells us something about the constitution of the viewer, the ideal viewer at that, that early moment. But what's interesting is that, that when we look at, um, even though the audiences at that time may have seen it as a novelty, so when we look at illustrations like these, uh, we, we easily understand that Edison, actually what Edison was doing, he was actually trying to adapt an existing cultural role to a, to, to a certain kind of a novelty that he was, he was proposing, which is of course films projected from a strip of celluloid film that, that in itself has had, had appeared as a possibility only a few years later, a few, few years earlier uh, in, in, in culture. But the basic situation he was proposing had been around for hundreds of years and, and had been experienced by people uh, for, you know, in both domestic and, and, and public settings. Now Edison was also interested and influenced by the fact that, that before that kinetoscope he had actually put, put on the market this kind of device which is Edison's automatic coin-operated phonograph. This was of course the, the uh, early device for recording and, and in this case only playing back sounds and it was used as a coin-operated device in the public space before it was launched really uh, as, a, as a domestic uh, machine for like recording and, and playing back. And, and of course, I mean, that, that this, that's some certain complexity to, do to this issue because we shouldn't say only that, okay, Edison came up with, tried to come up with a way of showing moving pictures. Okay, he was not thinking about projection. He was thinking about peeping at them individually. But of course, he also was thinking about the idea about maybe peeping through your ears that, that had sort of like, that he had tried already a couple of years later, earlier, and, and, and end up, ended up actually presenting both things in the same places, which is quite interesting. Here we have a picture where on the left, we see a row of these listening machines, and on the right, we have a, a row of these uh, peeping machines for visual media. So, another possibility that I mentioned is this idea about touch practice. And touch practice means a relationship with media where we are in a certain way physically touching the device, often affecting its functioning in one way or another. This is an early example of, of touch pra practice, which is a device called Camera Obscura that some of you may, may know. It's a, its principle was known already in the classical antiquity, but we think that the first really functioning devices were probably built only around the time of the Renaissance, so like 16th century or so. Which is interesting because in a certain way it is actually a projection-based device. Uh, so on the left uh, at B you see a lens that, that receives rays of light from, you know, from any, any object. Then there's uh, inside the device at M there's a, there's a mirror and then on top of that Horizontally, there is a ground glass, so kind of matte glass, on which you can uh, you can place a transparent paper. So this means that if you point this device 
on a bright and sunny day at the landscape or something like that. So you will be able to sketch with your pen the outlines of that landscape. So it, uh, it's a device that, that preceded the, 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 the photographic camera in the sense that the photographic camera made the images produced by camera obscuras permanent by means of chemical reactions. So you will play space photographic paper in that device instead of just a piece of paper on which you could sketch with a pen. But another way we can look at this device is, is basically uh, pay attention to the way how it interfaces the user with this device, where we are actually touching a kind of a screen and we are uh, doing something straight on top of that device. And that means we have a kind of a tactile relationship with that media device. And this is something remarkably different from most ca cases where we have projection. Because projected images often are kind of distant by, by nature. Even though there are cases where you could actually imagine sketching directly on the projected image. And I, I can probably give you an example. For example, painting panoramas. Uh, people used uh, projectors to project the outlines of the painted landscape on a large scale and was then going to be painted on the, on the wall. And so that is also like an example where there's some kind of a tactile relationship, not with the device itself, but the image of the device, something like that. I'm going to give you an example later. Now, touch practice obviously has to do with things that we often identify with interactive media, for example, where uh, we use all kinds of tablets, we, we touch the screens of our iPhones and all those devices, where there's a huge amount of that kind of devices. And, and when we start researching these things in, in detail from a media archaeological point of view, view we start finding pretty interesting so like, uh, steps you know that 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 sort of like probably had something to do with with the, the 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 evolution of these trajectories and one of them would be for example this television series in the 50s called winky dink and you which was interesting because it was very different from uh, most other ideas about how the television could be used as a new medium at that early stage in its in its sort of like mass development so this program basically um, featured children at homes drawing directly on the TV screen. Not directly on the tube, because they, they, they asked the parents to buy a so-called magic screen and a set of magic crayons that would be attached on the screen first. And then what happens is that the, the host would actually give instructions for the children and, and they would fo be following the magic crayons his finger. Put your magic red crayon right where my finger is, right here. You ready? And we're going to draw and it's going to be a surprise. Now, here we go, boys and girls. Follow me right around. So, right if I was a little there. bit taller, I could, okay, I could destroy down. that screen nicely with a, with a pen. Big surprise at the end. That's right. Got that? <laughs> down here. Now over. See, if you have your so kitchen, you know, you can be doing this with us. Otherwise, you just have to. I do this, by the way, in my classes, so for fun with my students. So we actually we project it on a whiteboard, and then the, one of the students goes and draws with this guy, you know, and then we see what actually goes out of it. Just for fun. Right. I refer to devices that people uh, carry with them, uh, interact with on the go, so to say. And probably one example we could 
we could we could mention would be um, devices like these that you, uh, used by the reporters. Like on the left, you see an uh, illustration from uh, Albert Robida's famous book uh, about the 20th, 20th century, published in 1882. The idea about this kind of like a wired reporter reporting from uh, battlefields around the world, and then the the battle reporters from our time. Again, this is a, a topic of a, of a completely other lecture that I've given several times, but, but, but it's just a kind of reference here. But so if we focus on this, this idea of, of projection now, so I think there are a few questions we can, we can ask. So first of all, why do we project? What do we use these projections for? And um, okay. There are at least a couple of things that I, I think I can list. So, first of all, there's the idea about uh, temporality. The fact that projections of images in most cases are ephemeral. They are easy to replace and to modify. So, unlike wall paintings or, or frescoes or panorama paintings, Projection can be quickly uh, adjusted. It can be, in most cases, quickly changed, and, and so on. And, and this is obviously linked with the idea about the economy. So the, the immaterial projection is much, much cheaper than material forms of, of large-scale images. And perhaps panorama painting could be an example. So in the 19th century, there were many large-scale panoramas in different forms that took hours and hours, which means months and months of work, to create these huge paintings, some of them in oil paint. So which means you basically to get basically to get, get make any profit for your investment, you had to show these for many cases for years in a certain building hope that people will be keep, keep on coming and seeing and paying for the entrance or whatever. Now, if you think about uh, projecting some little images with a, with a projector, that obviously, uh, it's, it's obvious that the basic cost is much cheaper and you can actually replace what you've got to show much, 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 much more quickly. Of course, the, the projection also has the fascination of easily making tiny things gigantic. As you, we all know, uh, a little piece of painted glass can be turned into large-scale imagery. And, and this thing has many, many implications. Also, the projection has this element of amazement, which has to do with the fact that there's something that appears something that disappears, and maybe something else appears again. And these can be surprising, strange things. So, and that's why projections have often been used to frighten and to surprise, and, I should add, exercise power. And this is probably a link with ideological, political uses of projects and technology. I'm going to show you some examples of, of that, that also when we get a little bit further. Then I think there's this idea about virtualization, which means that projections often create a kind of a other world. So they function as kind of windows, certain kind of fantasy realms. This is a topic that that my colleague Anne Friedberg wrote about in her book, and, and unfortunately died, which was a really a shame recently, uh, in her book uh, called the, the Virtual Window that she published uh, from the MIT Press uh, a couple of years ago. So projection can create certain kind of worlds. And I think the next step could be projection also functions for mixing realities. And I think that these two things are linked to each other. And I think that this is probably something that might should be useful for you, because I think that there are probably some people here from an architectural background, and some people from a media and arts background. 
because mixing realities, of course, means combining overlapping physical and immaterial elements. That I think it's an important and essential aspect of the uh, sort of like culture of uh, projection as well. And then there's the final thing, which is uh, has to do with the idea about multi multiplication and transportation. And uh, and this is an aspect that that Friedrich Kittler has has been uh, writing about, where the element uh, where workers, um, the for example, if you think about a simple slide, and perhaps a magic lantern slide projector as we'll be seeing soon, it has a very special function in the sense that that it can be uh, duplicated, multiplied and transport it easily from place to place. And uh, Hitler has paid attention to the fact that, for example, the famous art historian uh, Heinrich Welflin pioneered the use of slides in art history education in the late 19th century. And that actually meant, meant, meant a kind of a small revolution in the sense that, in most cases, art historians had to, have, had to speak for the auditory about classical artworks without really being able to show them in detail. Mm -hmm. Of course, we understand that the projected slide is not the same thing as an oratic single artwork, but it is still something that sort of like can form a link between them and also in this kind of an educational context. So let's, and um, what I want to do now, uh, I'm going to look at some of these varieties of projects in first and then in the second half of the speech I would like to focus more on this, this uh, uh, final aspect, the, the virtualization and mixing reality that happens in, in projections and uh, I would mostly like to look at uh, aspects that have been uh, uh, written about uh, more really, which is the projecting things in, in public architectonic spaces. Okay, historically speaking, so projection, the culture of projection can be um, found from a huge number of shadow related uh, pro projects uh, that can be found from many different uh, countries. I'm not going to sort of like go into this this topic here. So on the, on the right you see some of my students, we do shadow theater workshops and create uh, both uh, traditional shadow theater uh, presentations and, and also combined digital and analog theater experiences. On the, on the bottom you see uh, Felicia Treve, who was a famous uh, so-called ombre man in the late 19th century, who was famous for creating complex shadow projects and shows just by his hands which is, I think it's really fascinating because here the human hand is, is, is defined as the medium for, for those shows. So it doesn't need any kind of like a prosthetic additions, even though he did sometimes use things like blocks of wood attached to his wrists or things like that to be able to do these things. 